the implementation uh, recommendations. So the, the project goals kind of going along with those guiding principles, the, the three main goals were improving safety, um, working on mobility and comfort for those that are walking and biking and then increasing those rates. So we did a bit of uh, analysis on um, the, the community using a lot of our GIS based tools, um, looking at where we saw population densities, um, also looking at employment, um, and really where those uh, existing or existing connections were uh, to both the uh, pedestrian and bicycle network. Um, and so we were able to kind of overlay a lot of that data to really pinpoint uh, the, the needs uh, where we saw them. So here's an example of um, the, the needs analysis. Uh, again, looking at poverty, non-white, dependent ages, disability status, again, helping us focus on those areas that didn't always see uh, the investment as other parts of the cities do um, to really help us target where um, we wanted to look further to invest those um, improvements to both the, the bicycle and the pedestrian networks. Um, and then the other piece was looking at the level of traffic stress. Um, so for bicycles uh, in particular, um, looking to have a low number, which means no stress, you know, uh, a bike facility that, you know, is comfortable again for those all ages, all abilities, anybody from, you know, an eight year old to an eight year old feels safe and comfortable going on that facility. And then that goes all the way up to a four, which is your high stress, not really a dedicated bike facility um, that only the kind of strong and fearless bicyclists will ride on, you know, roughly 5% of the population. Um, so really targeting towards getting the existing network and future network to be uh, level of traffic stress one or two. So again, being able to overlay those um, gave us the opportunity to really focus in on um, where not just using lines on the page, um, having a bike, work, bike network every quarter mile, but really being able to focus on where those critical needs were. Um, and then being able to uh, take that information into the, the next stage. And I'll hand it to Blue to talk through some of our engagement. Excellent. Thanks, Cody. So um, whenever we're doing our engagement, we really start with these community profiles. This is a way for us to at least look at the demographic information as far as the data. Uh, one thing that's very clear, though, is when you start looking at these, this doesn't tell the story of what a community is made up of. All this is doing is showing us where people are and some of the high level information. How many people live in this area? What is maybe the median cost of housing in the area? But once again, does not tell us the entire story of the population. So that's where we really start to dive in deeper once we move into next phase, which is really looking at their commuter profiles. So um, as you can see, we have a couple very small little slivers over on the side. These are the people who are walking. These are the people who are biking. Uh, very, very small. And this project was trying to focus on how do we change those profiles? How do we make it easier to start to actually get to work or to be able to use better facilities or just be able to bike for leisure. And so uh, we already knew that 30% of workers in Grand Forks have a commute that's less than 10 minutes. That's very easy to replace those vehicular traffic uh, transportation mo methods uh, into biking and walking. And so 50% uh, of Grand, uh, Greater Grand Forks workers commute less than 15 minutes. So these ones maybe aren't as easy for the pedestrians to walk, but once again, having a good bicycle network really starts to encourage people to use cycling tracks or to be able to cycle to work. Uh, so from there, we started looking at who is walking in Grand Forks. So like I said, we have data, we have the numbers of people, but it's not the story of who is walking. And so this is where we started to dive in here of looking at how many households maybe are a single, ve uh, sing single vehicle household. Uh, and then also, what are the different things that they're using as far as to walk, what are they walking to downtown? Are they walking to recreation? Uh, and this also led into another part, part that Cody will talk about, which was our safe routes to school. Um, like I said, we're trying to make sure that this network is good for eight to 80, like C Cody said, uh, and make it safe for everybody to be able to utilize. 
So with that, we also started looking at who is cycling in Grand Forks. Um, Cody already talked about the level of stress. Uh, not many people are comfortable on those high level stress roads. So how can this study go in there and actually start to make it easier and more accessible for people uh, at all of our different public input opportunities? We heard that 40% of people would like to walk if it felt safer. And so this was a guiding principle throughout, throughout the entire project. So uh, one of the benefits that I got to bring to this project uh, was that I ran the bike share in Grand Forks. This is a completely free bike share uh, that we had, and this really started to show the cultural shift in Grand Forks of not just uh, a need for better facilities, but also the usership was there. Anytime that you tried to do new things, uh, people were willing to jump on these. And so it was a big cultural shift for the Grand Forks area because we saw that by making it completely free, uh, not only do people want better facilities, but they also still want to ride. And so when they didn't have the impediment of getting onto a bicycle, uh, we saw that change very easily and helped to guide this project. So like I said, before I actually joined Bolton Make, this was one of my roles was a steering committee member on this project. So for me, this one is very near and dear to my heart because I got to work a little bit on it in the Bolton and Make world, but I got to actually work on it as a stakeholder and this was a fantastic role for all of those different organizations in the community because they got to have their voice heard. They also got to be part of this entire process and they got to see what implementable projects they could start to align with and start to look at for their own future organizations. Uh, so the Downtown Development Association started looking at how do we pilot some of these different routes? How do we pilot some of these different opportunities? Uh, Blue Zones is still looking at those things and it's helped build a better bike share network as well because now they're getting uh, adaptable bikes. So people who are in uh, handicap accessible scenarios can actually start to use the bike share in Grand Forks because of projects exactly like this. It helped to uh, get additional funding. Uh, this project steering committee really was an opportunity for Bolton and Mank to hear from the community. Uh, public input is sometimes a little challenging in Grand Forks. And so this was an opportunity to hear directly from city leaders, from organizational leaders, from community based organizations, how the community is gonna feel before even taking it out for some of those different public input opportunities. So, like I said, public input opportunities. This was uh, everything from open houses to uh, having a bicycle pedestrian uh, subcommittee in Grand Forks that really focuses in on the Greenway trail system, but also just how uh, the network works for the Grand Forks area. Uh, there was everything from a community bike audit, which you've probably seen a couple pictures in here, uh, this was a good opportunity for people to come and bike around Grand Forks and see where maybe some of those more difficult areas are. Um, we also used a really nice interactive online mapping tool. This gave people the opportunity to give their own feedback no matter where they were, so weren't necessarily coming to those open houses or being forced to be in those areas. And we got to start seeing what the public told us. <laughs> we knew that 95% of people supported investments in biking and walking. We also knew that 89% of people prefer to live in walkable and bikeable areas. And 47% of people said Greater Grand Forks wasn't very good. So this is uh, a perfect opportunity for this project to go in there and really start to identify some of those different things that could actually help to solve the issues. Uh, looking at the different uh, connectors, looking at the bridges, the railroad crossings, signage and wayfinding, all of these were some of the different guiding identification pieces of the project. And <laughs> uh, with our two public uh, open houses, we really got to start to hear from people directly on what their identified issues were. So these weren't always uh, huge turnouts of people, but it was people who were there to really share their story, share what they felt about the Grand Forks area and how they could uh, put their input into this project. Um, from that, we got to have everything from these amazing newsletters that went out. Uh, we got to have the design context, uh, and we really got to start to identify those issues and those areas and how it would look if we started to put in some implementation. Yep, and with that, another key piece of this was actually taking a, around five kind of priority areas for both uh, the cities of Grand Forks and East Grand Forks that they identified were kind of, you know, up next or in the very near future that had a few more uh, 
technical issues that they were already aware of. So we were able to take a, a deeper dive in uh, a few of those corridors and have some kind of one-off neighborhood meetings to start to get that feedback that kind of would help jumpstart both cities in pro you know, progressing those, those projects forward, that they already had an understanding of where the neighborhood would be coming from. Was there general support? Was there general you know, discomfort with what the project was trying to do? Uh, so that they could uh, set themselves up better for, for when the project is actually coming along. So out of that, we uh, got a number of recommendations. Uh, you know, around 130 miles of facilities were recommended. Um, overall, the, the pedestrian network um, was, is relatively complete um, in both Grand Forks and, and East Grand Forks. Um, so just a few missing gaps there and then really looking at uh, making sure that those uh, networks are identified um, in the developing areas of, of both cities uh, so that as you know development continues and, and keeps going that that network continues to grow with it um, uh, the, the bigger part was uh, the creation of the kind of the uh, shared use path network um, that's where we saw a few more gaps especially in those east-west connections getting across Grand Forks uh, there is a number of good uh, north-south spines, uh, but the east-west connections were, were that major missing piece. Um, another uh, uh, part of the, the study that came out was uh, we did safe routes to school for all of the elementary and middle schools in both Grand Forks and East Grand Forks. Uh, so being able to develop that with our steering committee um, and, and having uh, the safe kids and the schools involved in that process um, also got us to uh, a good set of those safe routes to school plans that were able to be worked on with those schools and then as well handed off um, in a format that they could continue to update uh, without needing uh, GIS skills or other things to, to make sure those are, are continue to be updated as schools uh, uh, change what's happening around them. Here's an example of, of one of those. Uh, so this was all put into a PowerPoint uh, template uh, so again uh, anybody could get in there and you know move a line add a line add a sign remove a sign as uh, those areas uh, continue to change over time so that they are not just a stamp in time uh, safe house school plan but can continually evolve uh, with uh, the corridors around them um, one of the other big pieces was working through a prioritization matrix um, again, working with those in uh, city engineering, city planning um, on where we want, how we wanted to rank our prioritization, what we wanted to focus on, um, you know, was, you know, the employment density the, the most critical factor that we were trying to, to go after, or was it the connection to the, the Red River Greenway, um, you know, was it fixing those sidewalk gaps? And so we were able to put together that, that prioritization that really helped, um, again, kind of line up those projects in, in the order that they wanted to go in. Yeah. Uh, one of the best pieces of being on this steering committee was the opportunity to actually put input into this because we knew what maybe was happening in the next five years, both in terms of development, but also in terms of uh, what the city was gonna look like. And so this was such a valuable piece for this steering committee to have a voice in this and then also be able to work directly alongside the city, both cities, the MPO, and really be able to start to target those different things that organizations could be the champions for as well. Um, so with that, we kind of got the, the priority projects going. So uh, we ended up with uh, 11 projects and seven corridors in Grand Forks and then 13 projects on nine corridors in East Grand Forks. Um, and then again, going back to that uh, additional engagement uh, around those kind of five priority corridors. Uh, so we had University Avenue in Grand Forks uh, right off uh, UND campus. Uh, we had 13th Avenue South um, from Columbia Road to the, the Red River Greenway. Um, and then we had 17th Avenue South. Uh, again, focusing on those, those missing east-west connectors throughout the city was kind of the, the key priority there. Um, again, you had some connections up at UND, there were a couple connections further south, but really getting those east-west connectors in the core uh, of Grand Forks was 
uh, kind of part of their, their priority that we got. Um, and then in East Grand Forks, we, we looked at uh, River Road and Reinhardt Drive, um, you know, one connecting uh, a shared use path uh, to the levee, uh, to that, that greenway system. Um, the other was, was looking at how we uh, could fix some, some sidewalk gaps in the, the south end of East Grand Forks. Um, so again, being able to go out and engage with those communities, you know, show them kind of what, through our process, what those, those options were, were looking like to, you know, either create those uh, new bicycle connections or uh, create those, those added pedestrian facilities so we could start to get that feedback. Um, mostly positive, but we did have, you know, a few, a few naysayers that um, were there too on, you know, why are you looking at this corridor? Why don't you look two blocks south or two blocks north? We don't want it here. We're going to lose our parking. So having some of those conversations up front then again is, is helping the city that they know what they need to tackle as they put together their scope for those particular projects. And I know I sound like a broken record on this one, but with those community engagement opportunities by working with those community based organizations from the steering committee, it did help. It helped that we were able to be local voices for this project and we were able to almost sometimes massage those conversations through and let people understand the greater good of this entire project. So the other, the other piece of those uh, implementation matrix and prioritization was also assembling some um, cost estimation that the uh, cities in the MPO could use as they start to put together those projects. Uh, you know, so everything from what it would, you know, rough cost to put in a concrete shared use path or widen a sidewalk or, you know, create some, some curb extensions in the intersection to shorten pedestrian crossings, um, signal enhancements, um, all the way to some of the more amenities of, of kiosks and wayfinding. Um, again, just to be able to, to help uh, create those capital projects that weren't maybe in the capital plan when we started this process, um, but then giving them the, the information they needed so that they could properly uh, scope these and get these uh, in that capital improvement plan. Um, the other piece was, was also looking at um, all of the, the policies and different programs that both of the cities had um, and finding any recommendations that we, we could do to, um, you know, make walking and biking more accessible. Um, and there are certain uh, policies and procedures that, that can help do that. Uh, but then also looking at, you know, how can we help um, get support for, you know, getting them on the, the national walk friendly community or bike friendly community um, through the League of American Bicyclists. Um, you know, so again, engaging with the steering committee, working with the public engagement um, and working through all those different policies then gave us some of that other kind of softer side of, of how we can increase the uh, accessibility for, for walking and biking in greater Grand Forks. And with that, I think we're up for any questions. Did you guys look at uh, mass transit, uh, transit uh, locations in the town? Because I noticed in that map that you still need to go on like the Amtrak station, and that's right next to a 40 mile an hour road, and a lot of people walking off the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we did include, we, that was within the boundary of where we were looking at and looking at those, that sidewalk gap was part of that. Um, I'm not sure how it maybe got cut off on the map that we put up there, but it was, it was part of the, the overall project area. Yeah, and it was a piece that I know during some of our steering committee meetings we were talking about because it's not just make uh, bicycling and uh, walking safer for Grand Forkians and East Grand Forkians, it's also for visitors and it's people who are coming in. And so how do we start to make those connections? It was something that the city engineering brought up as well. Yeah, and we also reached out and worked with uh, BNSF and met with them to just uh, get them in communication with the, the city of Grand Forks and East Grand Forks on just how their operations worked and how um, best to coordinate with them in the future as projects come along, what their expectations are from uh, the local government and then kind of setting those expectations of 
of what the, the cities would expect from BNSF. So that was a helpful conversation to get that started and be uh, kind of out, out in the open. Yeah, I mean, so there's a number of, of funding sources for, for bicycle and pedestrian uh, projects. Um, uh, you can get HSIP dollars, Highway Safety Improvement Plan dollars. Um, the state of Minnesota has some active transportation grants through MnDOT. Uh, well, and even, I mean, like I said, with the bike share, this study actually helped to receive some different grant dollars from AARP and a couple different smaller grants in that way. So it was really neat to see both Safe Kids, the Downtown Association, this study brought that opportunity for them. So it's easy sometimes to think of just the, the big dollar signs on the big infrastructure pieces, but to change biking and walking in a community, it, it also starts with those policy decisions. It also starts with those users and maybe the organizations who really advocate for them. And so it, at least for that local sense, there was a lot of money that got opened because of this. Well, and I know. And it's something that I know, at least uh, federally, they're starting to push for the Safe Streets for All programs, things like that, which at least start to identify how, how do we look forward instead of just looking at existing conditions. So <coughs> it's something that I know uh, the Bismarck MPO is working on. I, I mean, Fargo and Grand Forks are both working on as well. So it, it's good to see those things. And it's part of the conversations with stakeholders and with groups is where are we missing and how can we do better on it? Yeah. And I think that was a key part of when we were looking at the, the future network, the plan network was knowing what some of those future developments were or where they were going to be at least so that, it, again, we could at least put the lines on the map that, hey, well, you need to think about this as those things happen. Obviously, we're not going to draw in every sidewalk that's going to hopefully be developed. Uh, but having that direction, then the, the city is able to go to those developers or other people and like, okay, this is what we need. Let's make sure we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. For the, the, the bike and ped plan? Yeah. Yep, the plan is up online um, on the MPO's website that has the full plan document. So it, it has all of those tables of the various priority projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I know just from, uh, at least for our organization, we had uh, bike tracking data to a certain extent with that bike share. So it 
it wasn't here's exactly where bikes are going, but it was here's where they're starting and ending. And being able to share that, at least you can start to identify where people are starting their bike rides, which is a huge amount of information. And I know you guys have. Okay. Yeah. And then I've, we had a lot of, of good GIS data from the, the cities and the MPO to help overlay on top of that, again, in existing condition formats, um, as well as other information that they were going through with the uh, transit plan and the streets and highway plan that were kind of going concurrently um, at the same time. So lots. <laughs> was there a second question? This is not part of the ADA transition mm -hmm. plan. It's a separate document, separate plan. And I believe that the city of Grand Forks is working on their ADA transition plan. And so this is, it's very accessible information for who's working on that. Yep, that, that's a, a very good point. Uh, we didn't connect directly with uh, the city maintenance crews or personnel. Um, we did get some input from our city engineering and, uh, committee members. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a fantastic point, it's true. It's, it's one of those difficult things living in the northern region on, on what do you do when it snows? How do you get that cleared off? Whose responsibility is it to clear those off? And and I, I it was that weird role where I got to still be in my previous career and now here. Um, we work directly with the city, especially for downtown. Uh, to make sure, how, how do we create better plans? How do we create better communication? And so projects like this and studies like this really did give us some at least ammunition. I don't want to say it that way because it makes it sound a little hostile, but it gave us the at least opportunity to have a conversation around, hey, we're really trying to incentivize these things. How can we start to look at it? And, and you're right. I mean, we have an amazing greenway trail system that stays cleared. It can be difficult once you start getting into right-of-ways, landowners, and all of those conversations. We did, we did talk about it. We, it was, I think we identified it as, as, as on the priority list of creating that better connection. Um, I, we didn't call out you know, a specific bridge location or anything like that for a new bridge or anything like that, but we did identify that as one of the, the critical pieces of, of getting across the river, especially towards the south end of town. And exactly like you said, the, the pier in the middle of the river it's identified by a lot of uh, different studies, different things as an opportunity. And I think the biggest difficulty for Grand Forks is the cost. Uh, it would be such a beneficial thing to the community, but it would also cost an arm and a leg for what some people often view as maybe not the most beneficial, while studies like this have done a really good job of starting to demonstrate the value of something like that. And I think whenever this can be paired with local organizations, be it economic development organizations who can say, Look, we already see benefits from wa biking and walking. Here's some more information that helps us maybe apply for another grant or at least further that conversation each time. Uh, 
uh, a lot of different uh, public input opportunities, so at the open houses, but also the interactive online mapping uh, was one, and then uh, on online, surveys. online surveys was also a huge tool for us. We got a good amount of feedback through, through the online surveys. A lot of our best communications was through that digital interface, um, being able for people to respond um, at their leisure versus coming and writing on a comment card in a two hour window on a Tuesday night. Um, got a lot more and more valuable feedback through a lot of those more um, individualized uh, engagements. People in the area have a lot of opinions, but they also don't have a lot of time sometimes. So all of those online options, and this was also happening 21 to 23, roughly. So it was at a kind of a different time as far as engagement opportunities too. Some people weren't as comfortable going out. So those online tools really gave good feedback throughout. Mm -hmm. So those were for the existing conditions based on existing uh, traffic, speeds, volumes, uh, presence of any sort of buffer between that bike facility and vehicular traffic. Um, there's, a, there's like 12 different uh, items that go into developing that, that BLTS number. Um, we didn't morph that into the future conditions. It was more of, we want the plan is for those future bike facilities to be a one or two. We don't want to plan a level four bike facility because again, that's not going to get used. But if you make that a, a one or two, so it's a shared use path that's completely separate from traffic or it's a, you know, a specific cycle track or bikeway that again is, has it separate from peds and separate from traffic versus um, you know, an on-street bike lane in a 40 mile an hour, 10,000 vehicle a day road. Yep. Right, so those, so those level fours then would be identified as this is a corridor that we want to make into a one or two. So again, maybe that's the, maybe the existing condition is there are no bike facilities. So you're riding in the street with the cars with no bike lane or sharrows or anything. That would still get identified that you want to make that into uh, a level two corridor in the future and then we have facility guidelines as part of the plan that say if this is a arterial road in order for that to be a level two it needs to be completely curb separated from that roadway or if it's a you know maybe it's a slower road or has less traffic um, but it's still uh, you know a level three or four today you could make it a one or two by maybe that just, maybe a bike lane would suffice because they are slower speeds or, or less vehicles. Um, so it was used to help identify those that needed improvement.
Um, so on the, the winter biking, winter walking, that, that did come up uh, through many of our, our conversations with the, the local residents on, you know, or even just to the, why are we investing in this if we can only use it six, seven, eight months of the year? Um, and it's really, that's, I mean, well, that is, can be true, um, you know, those that can say, well, it's cold, I'm not gonna walk or bike. It's not just for those folks, it's also for the folks that don't have a car, they have to walk to the bus stop, they, you know, need to take their, their bike across town because that is their mode of transportation and it's not always their choice. Mm -hmm. They and they, they do have those, um, and I mean I, I'm a 365 cyclist. I, I like cycling in the winter actually, and we see all across the planet there are a lot of people who do cycle all year long, and part of it is the facilities. And once you build better facilities, people still are able to start to be able to ride all year long. And exactly like Cody said, I, an important part of this project wasn't just saying who has the ability to bike or walk. I was also saying, who d who has to? Who that is their only mode of transportation? So it, it did factor into it, and it's it's part of those policy discussions. It's part of those implementation discussions. Is because once you have easier disconnected facilities, those can be maintained differently or separate from maybe a typical road. Oh, yes. So on, on the steering committee, we did have uh, one student representative, and then also on the bike ped committee, there was maybe two or three. And so it, it's hard because saying one student represents all of the student body isn't maybe accurate, but it was somebody who was there speaking on behalf. And for, for the bike share, majority of the riders, I think 80% of those riders are college students. And so for us, it was trying to pull as much information about the college students and what kind of facilities they would like to see as well. Well, and exactly like you said, it's not always about the big dollars either. Sometimes it is the, the smaller grants really go a long way because once you can start to get a cultural shift in a community about biking and walking, it also can start to change the conversation around how do we prioritize infrastructure and how do we start to look at these different projects. And so it, it just really starts to change the conversation at that level. Perfect. 
Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending and the questions.